Fuse Box. This is Fuse Box number 244. Absurd Atois. And you should pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Oh, certainly not. As he's clearly pulling all the strings and moving all the levers in our actual reality. (laughs) Welcome in, friends, to this, the 244th edition of Fusebox. I'm your... Seemingly normal, but actually made entirely of used auto parts, host, Mark Rose, and joining me at the dashboard of destiny, the Raja of the Rectifiers, Milt Keynes, everybody. Well, thank you kindly. You, you know, I gotta tell you, man, uh, that show title has me kind of turned on, but I, I, I don't have a freaking clue as to why. <laughs> well, Mr. Keynes... We, we have a rather fun and, uh, may I just say, perhaps enlightening program planned this time out. Do I need to, like, burn incense or light candles? Or, uh... yeah, I think all the illumination will come from within, sir. Okay, now you're just scaring me. <laughs> well, be not afraid, as uh, we're about to delve into the weird and wonderful land of absurdity, which also features part one of an interview I just did with the newly appointed president of Weird Portland United, Christine Lassiter. And uh, it's a delightful and, may I just say, enlightening chat we had. And um, I'm sure you're going to love that. Wait, uh, didn't the Unipiper have something to do with that? I mean, he he talked about that thing on our show. (laughs) You're absolutely correct, sir. Brian Kidd, Portland's own uh, unicycle riding, flaming bagpipe playing, Darth Vader helmet wearing chap, who is a a true delight, known nationwide as uh, the Unipiper, was very instrumental in forming that very organization, and uh, we will take a dive into all that with uh, Christine Lassiter uh, coming up shortly. Yes, and but also, uh, being film buffs around these parts, I thought I would share with you some of my uh, favorite examples of absurdist film that are... Uh, currently available for your dancing and dining enjoyment. I'm sure there's going to be one or two in there that you might not have heard of. One or two? (laughs) I bet I've heard of none of them. No, 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 no. You might be surprised, Mr. Keynes. Well, I remain skeptical. Well, as long as you remain milt, I'm fine with that. Huh? Yeah. So, friends, uh, when we return... Part one of an interview with a newly crowned president of Weird Portland United and a a few suggestions for your absurdist viewing pleasure. So, stay with us. Or cucumber. I still don't understand what's going on. It's finally flying out of the chute, friends, and heading to eyeballs near you. Grindhouse Resurrection Magazine, issue number three. It's jam-packed with grainy goodness on all 76 pages. Like this, a splendid article by David Phillips on Peter Bogdanovich's 1968 debut film, Targets, starring Boris Karloff in what many consider to be his finest work, which is not bad considering that this film, at the beginning, didn't even have a script As the story goes, producer Roger Corman was owed two days of shooting time from Karloff, and so told Bogdanovich, go make a movie, Peter. Read all the details in issue number three of Grindhouse Resurrection Magazine, available from 42ndStreetPete.net. Tragic Journals. Day 46. 
The funny little man from the crack in the wall was back. <laughs> he said he'd like to paint my portrait. I was mildly surprised to find that I was the paint. There's some seats on this ride you don't want to take. Got bolts? The Fuse Box Show. All righty, friends. Let's take a gander at some films that, uh, if and you like the taste of absurdism... Tastes like chicken, I hear. Well, a striped one with tentacles. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> let, let me just say here at the start... That um, the category of absurdist film goes way back to the uh, silent days and uh, with examples of experimental and uh, surrealist films by uh, Bunuel and others like The Andalusian Dog or Liage d'Or. But let me say that in um, this particular definition of absurdism, I'm not as much looking to the uh, apocalyptic definitions of the term as I am... Uh, sitting more in the comedic or just plain surrealist areas uh, for examples for our purposes here, friends. Boy, I'm really glad we got that straight. I uh, I was really starting to worry over here. Oh, worry not, Mr. Keynes. As uh, we have a fascinating assortment here, and let me let me just start with one of the most famous of the lot, Terry Gilliam's Brazil, which if by now you haven't seen it, well, you should, with whatever ending you prefer, as the uh, <laughs> the edition from Criterion has uh, both, maybe even three, I, I don't recall, but it, it has all those moments for you. It's uh, definitely got a dystopian flavor with a dash or nine of Walter Mitty thrown in, because uh, the main character, played by Jonathan Price. He uh, frequently sees himself as a winged warrior saving a damsel in distress. It features remarkable performances <laughs> by uh, Robert De Niro, Michael Palin, Catherine Hellman, Bob Hoskins, and Ian Holm. And uh, uh, obviously, the scenic design is fabulous and grand and a truly exceptional vision by Gilliam. Um, Frankly, uh, the best version that I've seen of this is uh, currently still available from uh, Criterion. You know, I know a lot of folks who really hate this movie. Yeah, you know, I I get that, and I like, and really seriously, like, like most of the films on this list, it's going to be a, a thing you you like or not. You know, pretty absent of middle of the road opinions, I guess. Well, I dug Time Bandits. Oh yeah, great one, and uh, definitely different. From this rather uh, comedically dark vision. <laughs> Next up, a bit more obscure, is a uh, movie made by the Elfman Brothers. Danny Elfman of Oingo Boingo fame and his uh, director brother, Richard Elfman. It's called The Forbidden Zone. And uh, this one was originally shot in 1978 when the Elfmans were involved in the Los Angeles stage productions of The Mystic Knights of the Oingo Boingo. Uh, this absurdist musical is uh, quite a spectacle. <laughs> now, I can't possibly uh, get this story down to something simple, but let me tell you this. It centers around an alternate dimension that is accessed through a door in the family house. Now, I heard that Elfman actually went bankrupt doing this thing. He did. Yeah, he, he uh, lost the house he lived in. He said recently, uh, d doing anything original is taking a chance. Financially, it bankrupted me and we lost our house, but I'm still glad I did it. Although, I'd change a few things if I had a time machine, of course. This one is uh, available from Arrow Video and is a uh, beautiful restoration supervised by Elfman. Okay, next up is a true classic and, well, maybe a wee dated, but irrespective of that, 
based on the story by Terry Southern and directed by Joseph McGrath, 1969's The Magic Christian, featuring Peter Sellers, Ringo Starr, with uh, appearances by Graham Chapman, John Cleese, that's right, Monty Python, Raquel Welch, Richard Attenborough, Roman Polanski, Christopher Lee, and a a host of others you, you just have to see to believe. This is one of the most absurd examples uh, in the list, friends. Uh, Peter Sellers plays a guy named Sir Guy Grand, an eccentric billionaire. And uh, together with his newly adopted heir, a homeless man he found sleeping in the park, played by Ringo Starr, named Youngman Grand, they start playing elaborate practical jokes on people. He's a big spender, this Grand, And uh, he doesn't mind handing out large sums of money to various people, bribing them to uh, fulfill his whims, or shocking them by bringing down what they hold dear. Now, listen, (laughs) this one (laughs) delivers in the absurdity department uh, pretty much from frame one, culminating in one of the most notorious sequences ever, involving uh, what, in fact... Will a person do for free money? This also featured the commercial hit by the band Badfinger, Come and Get It. You know, I did like that track at the time. It sounded like a, a Beatles song that wasn't released by them. Well, Paul McCartney produced the band and actually wrote that track, so, <laughs> so it stands to reason, yeah? Yeah, that one was a midnight movie before that was a thing. Yeah, indeed it was, uh, along with uh, Jordorowsky's El Topo. And this one. David Lynch's immortal Eraser Head from 1977. I think you could call this film absurdist in the uh, darkest definitions of that word, as it's, uh, it's quite dystopian and is at times actually comedic in a rather apocalyptic way. Brilliant use of sound in this one by longtime Lynch collaborator and sound designer. Alan Splett. You'll never look at a radiator the same way again. Or chicken, I fear. The late Jack Nance gives a remarkable performance as Henry, uh, as well in this one. Lynch did a, a painstaking restoration of his own film back in the early 2000s, and I believe it's still available from his site, davidlynch.com, but... Uh, Criterion did a release of the film as well in 2014, and I don't know that they used his elements or not, but uh, there it is. Now, these next two are definitely on the obscure side, but uh, worth checking out. The first one is a collection of shorts by Czech animator Jan Swankmeyer called, well, rather concretely, The Collected Shorts of Jan Swankmeyer. Uh, they are uh, two volumes... But I I, I would say any volume will put you right there. The animation we're talking about in these things is uh, the stop-motion type where models are used and manipulated uh, frame at a time to achieve, well, (laughs) in in his case, wondrous results. Uh, Food plays a role in many of his films, uh, rather whether they be short or feature-length, and oftentimes, as uh, in the case of Meat Love, an actual battle between two stakes, which just just has to be seen to believe. Uh, this is a, available as a, a DVD-only collection from uh, Image Entertainment. Yeah, I think it's out of print as far as I can tell, but still out there if you uh, search around a bit, but uh, highly recommended to see. And last, but... Certainly at the end here is Cemetery Man, or better known in Italy as Della Morte Della More, starring Rupert Everett. Uh, This one came out in 1994 and is directed by Michele Soave and has this (laughs) remarkable plot. Are you ready? (laughs) Bring it. (laughs) Francesco Della Morte, a cemetery watchman whose job it is to slaughter the living dead when they rise hungry from their graves. But uh, following a tragic tryst with a lusty young widow, played by Anna Falci in one of three roles, 
Francisco begins to ponder the mysteries of existence. Is there long-term satisfaction in blasting the skulls of returners? Will his imbecile assistant find happiness with the partial girl corpse of his dreams? And if death is the ultimate act of love, can a psychotic killing spree send Della Morte to the brink of enlightenment? Oh, hell, I'm in. <laughs> it's a brilliant, off-kilter, dark comedy with uh, huge absurdist moments. As a matter of fact, Martin Scorsese called this one of the best Italian films of the 1990s. And it is beautifully shot by Mauro Marchetti. This one is definitely worth seeking out. There is an Anchor Bay release of it uh, from 2006, but I know there's other versions out there. A lot of them probably imports and uh, all available, from what I can tell, currently online. So uh, uh, there you go. A few films to look up if you have a uh, hankering for the absurd, and uh, in a variety of flavors, too. So uh, I don't think you'll be disappointed by any of them, particularly if you uh, go in ready for a ride to the outskirts of your present reality. Your actual mileage may vary. The Fuse Box Interview. All right, friends. As promised, uh, we had a, just a downright delightful chat with the newly elected president of the Weird Portland United organization, Christine Lassiter. She was wonderful. And uh, as we'll see in this uh, first part of two parts, she had quite the journey of self-discovery, which uh, ultimately brought her to the <laughs> shores of Portland. So, uh... It's been quite a ride for you so far, huh? Yeah, that's uh, that's been a, a whirlwind of a of a thing. So I'm, I I um, I can't believe that in a very short amount of time I've gone from not being associated with the weird community to now being a facilitator of the weird community. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're much more than a facilitator, and uh, we're going to get into all that. But I just wanted to ask because uh, this is a question that comes up from time to time when we. Uh, ponder this notion of uh, absurdity in our life and times and uh, or, or maybe the lack thereof as the case may be have you noticed this trend lately towards humorlessness in our society and 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 uh, in particular what we call pop culture in recent times? Absolutely. I think that um, I know that the part of it of people becoming more sensitive, in some cases, warranted more yes, sensitive. Absolutely. Uh, I, you know, I'm a firm believer in when you know better, you do better. Right. And so there's there's that part of it where people are becoming more aware that sometimes humor can be hurtful or harmful. And then there's the other part of it who are just people who want to be angry just to be angry. You know, which is such a sad existence. Right. That's exhausting. Who can do that all the yeah, time? It is, and and you know, we we've we've always looked at uh, absurdity and um, the surreal as a sort of tonic, which can uh, diffuse a lot of those energies. Now, uh, what I see uh, uh, being celebrated there by the WPU, and uh, perhaps you can uh, uh, elaborate on this. I, I know that uh, uh, someone you were interviewing a while back for your show, and we'll get into all that stuff about your show as well, but uh, they had a rather remarkable statement that stuck with you. Yeah? Uh, yeah, I think you're referring to uh, when I interviewed the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. Uh, that was my only interview where I had two people. It was uh, Sister Donna and Sister Inda Beginning. One of the things that they said is that Sister Donna was saying that they make themselves as big and as weird as they can, like the like huge weird, <laughs> so that they're the biggest and weirdest things in the room, so that other people can feel comfortable being whatever they want. And that doesn't mean that they have to be a character or dress up or any of that stuff. They can just feel comfortable that if the sisters in their huge habits and they, you know they're and they are larger than life, <laughs> if if they can make that space large enough, then anybody can feel comfortable 
as who they are. That's very empowering. Oh, it, it was, really, really is. It touched me. I've, I've quoted it several times because it touched me so much. I, I suspect you have that that uh, show on your website or, or I, I link guess. it somewhere. Yeah, we will definitely link to that. Do you think those words uh, of wisdom are going to uh, shape your activities within the weird Portland United? Well, it already has. Yeah. I mean, I, I moved to Portland because of the weird. I, I came here because um, I'm originally from East Texas, uh, very conservative, you know, kind of the not your body, not your choice, everybody has guns kind of East Texas. Sure. Um, and I visited Portland on a trip, a work uh, just a work trip. I didn't know anything about Portland. I didn't even know that Portland's motto was keep Portland weird. I knew nothing. Uh-huh about Portland. Um, this was obviously before the last few years where Portland was all over the news. Yeah. But I just was here to visit. I came in the spring. It was stunning. Mm. I, trees I'd never seen, flowers I'd never <laughs> seen. It was just, I'm like, I, this looks like a magical land. And then just to see the personalities mm. that everybody was quirky and interesting and that nobody batted an eye about that. Nobody even did a second glance. And it was shocking to me because I come from a very judgmental place. Mm -hmm. And um, I described it as the people that are colorblind and they get the glasses that help them see color. Yes. And I felt like that when I landed here. I felt like I'm seeing color for the first time. And I decided on that trip, I'm like, I'm moving to Portland. And I've been a lot of places, but Portland was the place where I thought, awesome. there's something here for me. Yeah, that's really great. And how, how long have you been here then? Uh, it's six and a half years. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. That's great. I, I, you know, I too had that. I was familiar with the slogan before I came out here. I wasn't immediately hit with the weird or quirk as much as everybody here is just so nice. Oh, so <laughs> there's nice. There's just such a, where I came from, or it spent some time, I didn't come from there. We don't talk about that place. We never, but uh, (laughs) the place that shall not be named. But but, uh, that societal influence, that little cultural milieu, everybody was, it's all mine. I can't share anything. Get away. This is mine. You know, it's very difficult. But this place was just, was the carnival mirror reflection of that. And uh, so refreshing. And it's a genuine kindness. You know, I come where you have your kind of fake kindness. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, the bless their hearts kind of (laughs) mentality, (laughs) which definitely has that stabbing of, uh, oh, bless their heart. They're an alcoholic. What can they do? You know, whatever. Um, But for here, it's such a genuine kindness, just an openness. This was the first place I ever saw the signs. You know, they're everywhere here where, you know. You are welcome, and it lists all the different, you know, if you're LGBTQ, yep. you know, people of color. I've mm-hmm. never seen that. I saw it in schools, you know, and I yeah. was like, gosh, this is such a different vibe. It's inclusive, not exclusive. Right. Very, very, very important. You know, Portland used to be the place where people would come to because it was weird. I mean, they came here for that sanctuary, Mm -hmm. you know, to be able to be that true, authentic self. And then when all the big tech and all of that came in, all of these big businesses came in, a lot of people came into Portland because this is where their work was. Right. And they had not bought into the whole, like, I want to be here because it's this funky, cool, weird place. And with them not having that as their motive, I think that's when kind of a shift happened and the weird became uh, almost a negative. I've actually talked to people here in the last year when I would mention things about the weird community and somebody would say, well, that's what's wrong with Portland. And I'm like, I I don't. Wait, that's what? what's wrong with it you know and they they okay. associate it with things like you know people ODing on fentanyl downtown right. and you know all of that stuff and i'm like okay first of all those two things are they're not associated Mm-mm. we are talking about this fabric it's not it's not a community i mean like i said i'm a mortgage broker and i'm Right. In this community. Right. Um, you're, you know, UPS driver, you're, you're cashier at your grocery store, you're a waiter at your restaurant, you know. It is the very fabric and the fact that there are these groups of people who look at the weird as a negative is shocking to me, first of all, because I've gotten to see, especially over this last year, the amount of joy and the good that this community is is providing yeah absolutely and it's uh it's truly one of the most 
special things I've ever gotten to encounter. Coming from Texas, where none of this would be okay. That's true. <laughs> true. Maybe in Austin, where my son is, but mm. in the rest of Texas, even with how vanilla I am and how afraid of how I've been of, of stepping out of the norm because I come from such a judgmental place and with good reason to feel that way. I mean, I had slightly lavender hair when I used to be an insurance agent and I had somebody <laughs> say, do you think you're going to be able to sell insurance with purple hair? Uh-huh. And I was like, oh, I don't sell insurance with my hair. Um, I'm actually pretty good at what I do. Exactly. Tattoos, oh, those must be covered up, mm-hmm. you know, and, and just these little s- stupid things that mean nothing, that mean absolutely Mm-mm. nothing. And I'm so mild in those things, but I was getting judged in just the tiniest little bit of that I was yep. dealing with. And, absolutely. and so it didn't give me any kind of hope that I could ever be different, mm-hmm. you know, that I could ever grow out of that. And it wasn't until I got here that I was like, there. I know there's something kind of boiling up inside of me that's been there. I mean, I'll, I turn 50 next month. I've never had that opportunity to kind of like just live how I want to live. Before the pandemic, I was active in so many things. I really Mm -hmm. was just diving into all the things that Portland had to offer. I just was, I would get mad because there would be so many things to do. Yes. That I couldn't do all of the things that I wanted to do because there's too many things. And so after the pandemic and and everything, I now I really want to kind of start talking to the weird community. So I decided to do a podcast because, you know, everybody has a podcast now. I, again, didn't know how to do a podcast. (laughs) Uh, Did my little research and uh, found the studio and was like, okay, well, let's just do it. I've done public speaking for years, so I'm not afraid to do that. I've been on TV interviews for work stuff. I mean, Mm -hmm. I can do all that stuff, no problem. And when did you start this, by the way? I started in January of last year. Of last year. Everything is this confluence. All all of the stuff that we're talking about, one year. That's great. In one year. So it was late January. My first guest I extended an invitation to was Poison Waters. Mm. Oh, wow. And which is a big, like, that's a big ask. That'd be a big get. (laughs) Yeah. And Poison Waters said yes. With no episode. I had not done a single episode. Kevin asked me, you know, do you want me to be Poison Waters? Do you want me to be myself? I said, I want you to be comfortable because this is not about your weird. This is about your journey to find your true authentic self. I started this podcast, so I wanted to sit down with all these people Mm -hmm. who had these kind of bigger than life personalities and adventures they'd been on. And I wanted to talk to them about how they got to that point because I felt like there's a lot of wisdom in that journey. I sit down and I talk to them and I, the first thing I ask them is where'd you grow up? And we talk about, you know, what it was like for them in school and their family life and, you know, their journey all along the way. And, and it is big, weird and little weird. It is the poison waters and the unipiper and the sleeve stack, but it's also a girl I went to high school with. She was the one that was weird, but in a special way, like people, loved her you know she once went to a concert a b-52's concert with a beehive you know kind of thing so she was like super cool weird but she was such a unique fixture that she stood out even though she's like you know four foot eleven or something (laughs) she stood out well the hair was three feet you know so well she was she was a cheerleader and she saw these things but she's also weird and i loved it and i thought i I hadn't actually talked to her in 30 years we'd been in theater together but i hadn't actually had a conversation we were friends on facebook didn't really know what her life had been but i just knew so i reached out to her and i'm like hey brooksanne i have this new podcast i'd like for you to be a guest and uh, i knew that she made couture wedding dresses now which is very like that was very cool and then she was at the same time she was writing a blog about her journey on how she got there. So right before the interview, I read her blog and I was like, oh my God, I hit pay dirt. She had been on a movie set because she did a lot of costume design stuff. Uh. She'd been on a movie set where it was a action adventure, but it was with all porn stars, you know, or, you know, uh, which, Great. you know, she worked for, she worked for like the Henson, uh, oh, puppet, wow. you know, so That's she, great. she had like cookie monster for like, oh, she had all this terrific. stuff. She made the hat for the undertaker. 
Oh, the rest, yeah, the wrestler, the Undertaker. She made like his hat, Jeez. like his the hat that he's well known for, and I mean all of these huh. things that I'm like I could not have ever guessed that it would have been I, all of this stuff, but I knew she would be a good mm-hmm. talk. The same is true for like the UPS driver in Multnomah Village. Because when I work there, he's such a character, and I didn't know him well, but he was such a character, and I could tell there was something about him. And then, you know, he makes these, you know, octopus out of wood that are that say fuck, you know, and uh, <laughs> you know, so they're octopuses, and uh, and he has That's some awesome. podcasts, and you know, and he's uh, give me that guy's address. Oh, I, I, yeah. I, I can, I can yeah. get up with him. He's wow. great. Um, you know, so I've been on his podcast a couple of times. He has two of them. Goes back to that thing of it's everywhere. Don't mistake it for being just these. Bigger than life characters, mm-hmm. and as a character that actually takes up a lot of room, yeah, that's right. That's a... <laughs> I can say mm-hmm. it's not. This is such a tiny fragment. It is so deep. I think that's the thing to uh, to to bear in mind with this. That it's not all physical spectacle. Sometimes right. it's it's really a lot of this internalization that we're seeing. You know, and uh, that's why I'm kind of applauding the fact that you're wanting to expand this out. You know, in a town that it, that favors ex- inclusivity. <laughs> Uh, this is a this is just a great tonic for the for for our times and uh, acknowledging what that actually is in people is is fabulous. Yes, it is. And uh, you know we'll learn in the uh, next part of this interview what her plans actually are for Weird Portland United, and they're pretty spectacular, as, as well as her experience producing a music video called What Else? We are the weird. <laughs> <laughs> we are the weird? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> oh, can't miss that. <laughs> no, you can't. No, you can't. And uh, with that promissory note, uh, we'll pack up our talking cucumbers and storked leg chickens with real tentacles and slide back down the drain in the floor, but not before thanking our contributors to this edition of Fusebox, Christine Lassiter and... Gregory Wilson for making this one just a skinny millimeter better than the other leading brand. Thanks as well to the Duke of Decibels, Milt Keynes, for technical assistance and so forth and so on over there. Oh, it's been a slice. And uh, hey, folks, we yap at you all the time about this, but it really does help the cause here when you take a moment and go over to our Patreon page and become a subscribing member. Yes, for far less than a package of instant meat-flavored wine, you can help sustain this humble production for an entire year. And uh, this show (laughs) contains not a speck. Of cereal. Yeah, go on over to patreon.com forward slash the fuse box show and sign up. You'll get free swag, early show releases, and access to hidden secrets of the universe unknown even to that Midwestern pillow salesman. And not a speck of Krakens will be released. Huh? I punted. Uh. Uh, Well, thanks as well to the uh, good folks at Grindhouse Resurrection Magazine for their support. And uh, issue number three is out. So grab it while it's still available. Yeah, and not confiscated by the thought police. Find it at 42ndStreetPete.net. And, of course, thanks to you, friends, for pushing play on this one. We do so appreciate you spending some time with us here. We know there's a lot out there vying for your attention. I have been your fully distracted person of interest, Mark Rose, saying, until our next cartoon. Cartoon.